to welcome all of you this morning and including for the Sabbath morning worship service here at OPM, Rossi Pioneer Mission. And I also want to welcome those who will be viewing this uh, later when it's posted to the PHM website, the uh, YouTube, YouTube um, account or channel there. I have titled this message, Why All the Disasters and Violence? And I would welcome or invite you to turn in your Bibles because this, I'm not going to put everything on the screen like I have been. And you've probably already noticed that there is no handout going with this one. So I know some of you look disappointed. Sorry. Um, but I decided to go a little different route this time. Um, <laughs> some downturned faces over here. I noticed that. Uh, but um, turn in your Bibles to Mark 13, please. The disciples of Christ had been asking him about what he had been telling them about his, what was going to be happening in the future. And they, they, they wanted to, they, they got him apart by himself someplace and they got a chance to talk to him and they said, you know, when are these things going to be? And so Jesus starts talking to him here and he says, you know, you got to be careful. Someone's out there trying to deceive you. And uh, there's even going to be some coming and saying, I'm Christ, and they're not Christ. So, and then he says, you know, you're going to be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. Don't be bothered. Have we been hearing of wars and rumors of wars? Seems like there's at least two, three, or four, maybe... Uh, who knows how many more wars going on right now? And then there's rumors of so and so is going to attack here, there. Uh, war may break out over there. Um, the I little nation of Israel and that whatever that strip there along the land there, the, them and huh? Gaza. Gaza. Thank you. They they're exchanging uh, pleasantries if you will, and they're not very pleasant. The one group, the people from Gaza are firing rockets. I forget how many. It says they have like 20,000 rockets stored up to fire. That's a lot of rockets. To, they can be firing for a while. And Israel has all their F-15s, 16s, and then F-35s, and they're launching airstrikes, and and the Gazites have even resorted to, they're pretty innovative. They launch balloons, fire balloons, and let them float over into Israel, and other crazy things like that. So, wars, rumors of wars, don't be troubled. For such things needs be, but the end shall not be yet. And then in verse 8, for nation shall rise against nation. We're seeing that, right? <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. It's good to have help. <laughs> for nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be earthquakes in divers places, and there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginning of sorrows. Famines and troubles, are we seeing those? Oh, yeah. Famines. Big time. Big time. We're blessed. We haven't seen a famine here in America. How many of you have gone without a meal recently? Not even for one day, usually. We have food. We have plenty of food. But that's not the case throughout the world. Not the case. But 
But take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils. That has happened. Happened to me. <laughs> Not that long ago. A Sabbath school council. Fortunately, there was a Nicodemus in the crowd. They fell one short vote, one vote short of silencing us and preventing us from studying the spirit of prophecy. We haven't been beaten yet, though, in the synagogues. I haven't heard of anyone being beaten in the churches yet. And ye shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake for a testimony against them, and the gospel must first be published among all nations. That's happening now. Do you know that PHM has people who are viewing these YouTube videos, these presentations, all around the world? And that as soon as one is posted, it's available to anyone who has an internet connection anywhere on the surface of the earth. And some people have cell phones now who don't even have, already have food on the table. The cell phones are almost ubiquitous. They're almost everywhere. So the truth is readily, becoming readily available. But when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what she shall speak. Neither do ye premeditate, but whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that speak ye, for it is not ye that speak, but who? The Holy Ghost. That's assuming that our life is in harmony and we have the Holy Ghost filling us. Christ in you, the hope of glory, right? And then, now the brother shall betray the brother to death, and the father the son, and children shall rise up against their parents, and shall cause them to be put to death. When you turn on the news today, have you noticed, if you're, I, I don't like watching the news. I don't know about you anymore. It's so full of bad news. Have you noticed that there are parents killing children? and children carrying parents, and other strange <coughs> things. It is crazy out there. 11-year-olds, 13-year-olds, killing their parents, killing their grandparents. It's just insane. I remember in my life at one point, I thought, how can it ever be that parents will kill their children? or deliver them up. It's beginning to look like it isn't too hard of a stretch anymore to imagine that. But this is talking about those who will betray their own family to be put to death for what they believe in. That's pretty amazing. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. So it shouldn't surprise us when we're hated of all, you know, for Christ's sake. It shouldn't surprise us. In verse 14, But when ye shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, This verse, as I was thinking about it, as I was preparing this, and I was out walking, it suddenly came to me that this could be speaking of something that I'd never thought of before. You know, back when the pioneers were alive and the Seventh-day Adventist Church got started, and Ellen G. White, during her lifetime, she wrote near the end of her life, they believed in the one true God. 
They did not believe in the Trinity. And she said near her end of her life that for the past 50 years, the foundation that they had laid was still the truth. There is no evidence that they converted or changed to anything different. And yet, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has said that they did. And I wonder whether it is not, here, this verse 14, this abomination of desolation, the Trinity doctrine has been planted right smack dab in the middle of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. In fact, it is the leading Number one uh, of the 28 fundamental beliefs, it is right there at the front of it. And in my opinion, and that's just my opinion, but uh, Satan has been allowed to plant his banner right in the middle of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And, you know, you can take that for what it's, you know, everyone is welcome to understand it the way they see it, but I just wonder whether that's not what this is talking about, that the Seventh-day Adventist Church has allowed this abomination of desolation to set up its standard right in the middle of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And there we have, and, and I'm just going to be blunt, the, bomb, the Trinity Doctrine is truly an abomination of desolation. It is satanic, and it's what it proposes to, to say that Scripture says. Scripture doesn't say that. That is come out of paganism. It came out of Babylon. Study it and see. And then we're told, bounced ahead too far. This little screen's tough. And let him that is on the housetop not go down into the house, neither enter therein to take anything out of his house. And let him that is in the field not turn back again for to take up his garment. We recently in the news here this last week or two, there was a fire in a town called Paradise here in California. I know you're all aware of that. Those people had very short periods of time to get out of there. They wanted to go back and get things, but it was a question of, do I get out and save my life, or do I save some of my things? I heard a story about it where a young man was in a vehicle with others, and was, they were on their way out, when he suddenly remembered he had a pickup truck that he greatly probably something that he'd built, you know, and restored. And he got out of the vehicle and went back to get his pickup truck, and we don't know what happened to him. When we see this abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing where it ought not, and it ought not be in the center of the St. Adams Church, that is not who God is. He's not a trinity. He doesn't reveal himself as a trinity. Yes, truly, there is a God the Father. John 3.16 says that clearly. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That is not a, what's that word that's used? Metaphor. That is not a metaphor. That is not make-believe. God, if we can't trust God to tell us exactly what he means, who can we trust? The theologians? When scripture says clearly that he is a God the Father and he has an only begotten son, that means he is a father who has an only son. We don't need to have this abomination of desolation standing where it ought not. But woe to them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. It will be hard for those who have children. It will be very hard. Much harder than if you don't have the children 
and when you're trying to flee. And you know what it's like. We just heard a story about what it's like going up a, a, a road that's covered with snow. You don't want to be trying to escape in the wintertime. It would not be a pleasant time. And this is what Christ is telling us about conditions and what things are like now. And we're seeing it. We're living in that time. He told this to disciples how long ago? That's a long time ago when he told them about this. But now we're living in this time. How many of you here this morning are wanting and planning on being a saint in heaven? Raise your hands if, you, if that's what your plan is. Should have been every hand go up, I hope. Let me read you something. It's found in Signs of the Times, November 14, 1892, paragraph 8. Only those will enter heaven who in probationary time have formed a character that breathes a heavenly influence. The saint in heaven must first be a saint upon earth. Now, how many think you're ready to be a saint in heaven? How many hands? Anyone here think they're a saint on earth so that you can be a saint in heaven? How many have read this before? How soon do you think you need to become a saint on earth? <laughs> this is pretty shocking, isn't it? If you think about it, it's pretty shocking. If you're not sure that you're living as a saint on earth, well, think about it this way. Let's say you are used to doing something in your life that you know you shouldn't be doing. Would you be happy if you could be allowed to go to heaven? How would you be able to continue doing that in heaven? It wouldn't be allowed. Let's read the rest of it, though. The habits of speech, the character of our actions, put a mold upon us, and that which we cultivate in our association with others in this life goes down into the grave with us and will be unchanged when we come up from the grave. Many are deceiving themselves by thinking that the character will be transformed at the coming of Christ, but there will be no conversion of heart at his appearing. Our defects of character must here be repented of, and through the grace of Christ we must overcome them while probation shall last. This is the place for fitting up for the family above. Amen. That's pretty straightforward. If we're not doing it here, it's never going to happen, and we're not going there. It's time to go home and take a look at your life and say, what is it in my life that doesn't belong here? Because I'm sure we're all coming here simply for the reason that we're planning to be ready when Christ comes. And yet, most of us, if not all of us, are pretty sure we're not ready. Or at least we're concerned about it. Or we're not certain. Is this the time to be uncertain after what we just read about what Christ told his disciples and what we know is happening? Doesn't seem like it's a very good time to be uncertain. We should be sure. Can we be sure is the question. Can we be sure? And I will give you my short answer. Yes! Yes, we can be. Then why aren't we? What is it that keeps us from being sure? It's those little things in our life that we know we shouldn't be doing, but we still keep doing them. 
we let Satan rule. We haven't been willing to purchase the pearl of great price by giving up everything. Are you with me? Why is it that we keep clinging, keep the door halfway open for Satan? Why don't we just slam it in his face? But we don't. And yet we know, we, most of us really understood this and knew this. It's just a little bit shocking to see it so graphically portrayed. We don't have time. In fact, as you mentioned, you can have an accident that should be a real wake-up call, an accident that just totally destroys the car you're driving in, and you wonder, how did I survive that? Only by the mercy and the grace of God. Because he sees something in you that's worth trying to save yet. Remember the story of Achan? The children of Israel had just taken Jericho. And it had been such an easy battle, all they did was march around, that they got real puffed up. They got real excited and proud. Oh, there's a little town of AI over here. No big deal. A couple thousand men should do it. And off they went. What happened? They got their tails kicked. They lost a few men. And they came back, and Joshua threw himself on the ground and said, Lord, what happened? Why did this happen? Why did you let this happen to us? He was basically coming real close to complaining. And God says, what are you doing on the ground? Get up. He said, there's sin in the camp. One person's sin prevented the whole nation from fulfilling what God had given them to do. Now, does that put a whole different light on sin that we cherish? We're trying to go out and take this gospel to the world, and when there's sin in the camp, we're going nowhere. One person who cherishes sin can derail the whole gospel. What did they do with Achan? They gave him a chance to repent and change. He saw the, you know, they started drawing lots. They didn't just go directly and point him out. God could have done that. He could have said, there's your man. Achan had the opportunity, according to patriarchs and prophets, to say, yeah, I did it. I'm sorry. I want to change. But he didn't do that. In fact, when they finally pointed him out, he says, yeah, I did, but it was a goodly Babylonish garment. Oh, it was so good. I just couldn't resist it. And they took him out and his entire family, if I remember right. And they stoned the whole bunch. They got the sin out. And then they went up and they overrun AI and everything else. If we get the sin out of the camp, there'd be no stopping us. What's holding up the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? What's causing us to only get a few sprinkles of rain? It's sin in the camp. It's sin in the camp. 
we're still cherishing sin. We're not going to see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit until we get the sin out. Just like we're not going to be a saint in heaven. God can't pour out his spirit when we haven't surrendered our complete lives to him. When we're still holding out. Here's something that I find interesting. Prayer. This is Acts of the AA, Acts of the Apostles, page 564, paragraph 1. Huh? Yeah, I'm not sure if I have it. I'm going to check it. I'm going to check. <laughs> Thanks for the reminder. Let me see. I may have it here. Nope. I didn't put it up. Sorry. AA 564, paragraph 1. Prayer is heaven's ordained means of success in the conflict with sin and the development of Christian character. The divine influences that come in answer to the prayer of faith will accomplish in the soul of the suppliant all for which he pleads. For the pardon of sin, for the Holy Spirit, for a Christ-like temper, for wisdom and strength to do his work, for any gift he has promised, we may ask, and the promise is, ye shall receive. But you know what I notice? Oftentimes prayer is telling God what he already knows. Do you think God doesn't know what's going on in our lives? The story of Job tells us that he does. Nothing happens in our life that God hasn't pre-approved. He hasn't signed off on. When Christ spent 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness... Was he reminding God for 40 days and 40 nights of what was, that he had no food to eat? And how bad it was? No. His heavenly father, know, your heavenly father knows what you have need of. So he isn't ignorant, and he doesn't need to be reminded. Prayer should be us listening to God. To listen to him talking to us. We need to hear what he's got to say. He doesn't need to hear what we have to say. The only thing he needs to hear from us really is that we're willing to surrender and submit. Christ spent 40 days and 40 nights preparing for his life work, and then he met Satan in tempta with the temptations as we hear, know the story. If it took Christ 40 days and 40 nights, how long should we need? Christ hadn't even sinned up to that, nor did he ever. He was tempted in all points like as they are, yet without sin. How did he do it? Preparation. That's when prayer should be. Should we drop to our knees in prayer when we're tempted? Is that what Christ did? How did Christ meet temptation? By praying? Yes. Prayer is before. That's the preparation time. That's listening to God. That's having the word here. Not here in your hand. Satan just laughs when he sees the Bible in your hand. He knows that does you no good. It's got to be here. When you have temptation, you meet it with the word there, you can speak it from here. What's the word? It's supposed to be a sword, right? Sword proceeding out of the mouth of Christ, right? That's how the devil's defeated. If you don't have the word here, you're not going to be able to have it here. And we're never going to be a saint on earth if we don't have the word, that's the only way to overcome temptation. And that's been my experience. 
You know, our prayer should be for difficulties in our life. Our prayer should be for whatever it takes, Lord, to get me to that point where I'm a saint on earth. The best blessings God can give us is difficulties. Because nothing wakes us up more than a car wreck when we almost lose our life. You can be sure that gets the attention. When something goes wrong in your life, that gets your attention. Then we get scared. You know, it's like when the, you're on the boat and the boat's sinking. Everyone starts praying. They didn't pray before. They could care less about God. But when things go bad, you start caring about God. So the best thing, you know, the best thing that happened in Job's life was what happened to him. It's just what he needed. Because he wasn't quite sure about God. And after what had happened to him, he started understanding. And part of another thing was with Job, he spent most of that time, him and his buddies, talking and Job started trying to talk to God about it all and sort of almost complaining. Although he did say, though he'd slay me, yet will I trust him. But then when Job finally shut up and started listening to God, you read it there in Job toward the end of the book of Job, he started listening. That's when things turned around. That's when things turned around for Job. We don't do enough listening. We want to tell God. We want to tell God what we need. And it's more like complaining in many cases. We should be praising the Lord for victories won. Victories won. It should be nothing but praising the Lord for victories won. We should be, or we should be saying, Lord, please give me some, so I see the problems. Give, give me some difficulties. Give me some way of knowing and seeing what, what the, where the plague spots are. I want to be a saint here on earth. I need to know how. Show me how. Show me what needs to be changed. Our prayer time should be a listening time. Jesus Christ was tempted in all points, like as we are, yet without sin. And that can be our testimony, and must be. There will be no one actively sinning who goes to heaven, only converted sinners, those who are covered by the righteousness of Christ pass in. But there will be no one who has their character changed Many are deceiving themselves by thinking that the character will be transformed at the coming of Christ. Won't happen. There's no changing going on then. When the ten virgins wake up, the five that are empty, their vessels are empty, nothing is going to change. They're lost. They're lost at that point. Now's the time to get your vessel filled. I'm going to share with you four texts that I think are just like gold to me. I learned them by heart a while back. And they, I believe, based on my experience with them, that if you meet the devil, just as Christ did, with a promise, with it is written, that you can't sin. The story of Christ there in the wilderness tells me that if you meet the devil with a promise, with, with an it is written, you can't sin. While you're repeating the promise, you cannot sin. I've had to repeat it dozens of times sometimes until, the, until that temptation loses its power over me. But if you don't have it up here, you're not going to be able to use 
the, it is written to defeat the devil and cause him to flee from you. And here's those four texts. I've shared them with you before. James 4, 7 through 8. James 4, 7 through 8. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. 2 Peter 1, 4. 2 Peter 1, 4. And 2 Corinthians 7, 1. 2 Corinthians 7, 1. These four texts in that order flow so well that it's almost like as if they were written continuously, and yet they're written by James, Paul, and Peter. And they didn't really collaborate. What? Sure. James 4, 7 through 8. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. 2 Peter 1, 4. 2 Corinthians 7, 1. When I first found these, and I found them, I didn't get them from anyone else. I don't know of anyone else who is pushing this idea. I always thought that surely someone would have a, a solution to temptation. The best I've ever found was when I was listening to Preby. And he suggested that you start praying. But that never worked for me. Or you sing a song. I didn't find that worked either. He also suggested you memorize scripture. But he didn't seem to emphasize that very much. And most people don't like to memorize. Some people say they can't. But I'll tell you one thing. There's a promise for that one. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. There's no excuse. None for continued sinning or not memorizing. James 4, 7, and 8 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Submit to who? God. Resist who? Yeah, and he will do what? Right there. That's all you need. If that's all you know and all you can remember, just keep repeating it. No. <laughs> Sorry. I did it a little different this time. I gave myself a little more freedom. Wait a minute, I might have the slide. There it is. This is a powerful verse. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Let's be a saint on earth. We're planning on going to heaven, I think. Maybe some of you aren't. If not, why are you wasting your time? Right? If you're really planning on going to heaven, let's get serious about it. If you're going to go on a trip somewhere or go on vacation, do you go, well, I don't know. Maybe I should get ready. Maybe I'm going to go. I'm not sure if I'm going to go. No, you get all excited. You go, we're going to get ready. We're going to go. Oh, it's going to be so much fun. Oh, let's look at some pictures. Let's, let's look at some travel. Uh, uh, and we go, we're going to heaven. Yeah, maybe someday. Who knows? Maybe we'll be ready. Maybe Jesus will come in our life. Nah, maybe he'll come next in someone else's lifetime. And we treat it like that. Why don't we get excited about it? And then 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Nothing that's happening to you is unusual. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. There's the story of Job. God signs off on everything that comes to you. 
He doesn't let anything come to you that you can't handle. Problem is, we don't want to handle it. We don't even care. We keep doing the same things we've been doing and thinking we're going to go to heaven doing those same things. We're not. But will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to... There is a way of escape. He always gives you a way to escape. There's no need to give in. No need to sin. Take the way of escape. 2 Peter 1.4 Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through us. There's the way of escape. Being a partaker of the divine nature. How do you do that? We invite, all we have to do is ask. We invite him in, Jesus Christ. And the final one, 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Does that leave any room for retaining any of our sinful tendencies? No, none. There is no excuse. There is no reason. Let's go home. Let's get sin out of the camp. What do you say? Amen. Let's close with prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the word. We thank you so much for your son. We're so thankful that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man cometh to the Father but by him. We want to be a saint here on earth. We want to be a saint in heaven, and we know, we understand. May we commit ourselves to getting sin out of our lives and out of the camp. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.